Welcome to this education film for patients who will be having spinal surgery. I'm Georgina Hooper and I'm one of the physiotherapy team here at University Hospital Plandock. For several years now we've been running an education session for patients who were coming in for spinal surgery. While many of these patients found these sessions beneficial, others were unable to attend in person. This film has been produced to provide the same information to all patients with the aim of improving their hospital experience. In order for you to have a positive hospital experience, a team of many different professions is involved including physios, occupational therapists, nursing staff, pain team nurses, anaesthetists and your consultant spinal team. This is the multidisciplinary team and at the centre of this team is you, the patient. You will be involved with all aspects of your care and decision making. Any time during your stay, if you have any questions about your care, please ask a member of staff. As we go through this film, the roles of these different professions will be highlighted and discussed. The aims of this film are to provide information before your surgery, help you prepare for your stay in hospital and for your discharge home, hopefully answer any questions that you may have. The film is in four main sections. Section 1, coming in for your operation. Section 2, what to expect in hospital before your operation. Section 3, what to expect in hospital after your operation. And section 4, continuing your rehabilitation after going home. By now, you will have already been for an appointment to discuss your operation with your surgeon. Your surgeon will have gone through with you why you are having the surgery and the benefits and risks that may come with that surgery. Here is one of our spinal consultants, Mr. Michael McCarthy, to talk about some of the anatomy of your spine and what can cause you to have problems. Hello, I'm Mr. Michael McCarthy, one of the spinal surgeons here at University Hospital Clandock. You will have already seen myself or one of my colleagues prior to watching this. I'm going to talk about the anatomy of the spine, possible causes of your symptoms and potential surgical options. Here I have a model of the lower back or lumbar spine. The function of the lumbar spine is to provide support for the body, provide movement and protect the delicate nerves that pass through the spinal canal, going on to supply sensation and movement to the legs and other structures of the lower body. The lumbar spine has five vertebral bodies, the large bones here, and in between those bones are the discs, or the shock absorbers of the spine. We can see here the spinal cord that goes down the middle of the spine through the spinal canal. At each level, on the left and on the right, spinal nerves will come out of holes formed between the vertebrae called foramen. These nerves will go down the legs to supply structures in the lower body, including the skin with sensation and the muscles with power. On the back of the spine, we have some small joints called facet joints. We have the lamina and these knobbly things that you feel on your back, the spinous processes. The sacroiliac joints are the large joints that join the sacrum to the pelvic bone. There are various reasons why you are undergoing surgery on your low back. These can include problems with the discs, the joints or other structures in the spine and there are various surgical solutions to those problems, which your surgeon will have spoken to you about. I'll now show some scans and x-rays to illustrate the normal anatomy of the spine, and also when things are abnormal. This is an example of an x-ray of the lumbar spine. It is taken from the side. We have the vertebral bodies and the spaces in between where the intervertebral discs lie. The spinous processes are at the back and here you can see the large holes or foramen where the nerves come out to supply your legs with sensation and movement. Here we have an example of an MRI scan of the lumbar spine viewed from the side again. At the front is your gut and the spinous processes are at the back. This is a normal scan and we can see the vertebral bodies with the discs in between. These discs are healthy and showing a white centre on the scan. The spinal cord is the grey area that ends about here and then spinal nerves float the rest of the way down the spinal canal in the spinal fluid. The spinal fluid on this scan is white. Here we have another MRI scan. 
but it is viewed from the bottom of the body looking up, a different direction from the previous example. The gut is at the front and we can see the large vertebral body here. The spinal nerves are the black dots that are floating in the spinal fluid. The fluid is white on this scan. At each level of the spine, there will be one nerve coming off to the right and one to the left, providing sensation and movement to the legs. This is the spinous process you can feel on your back. And these two small joints here are the facet joints at the back of your spine. This is a normal MRI, and you can see that there is nothing pressing on the nerves floating in the white spinal fluid. This is now an example of an MRI which shows a disc prolapse. And if we compare it to the other picture you have just seen, you can clearly see the disc prolapse that will be pressing on those spinal nerves and likely to be causing pain down this patient's leg. This is the same patient, but the view is now from the side. And you can see the disc prolapse is pressing out onto the nerves. There are various different types of surgical options that your surgeon may be performing. The three main reasons to perform spinal surgery are to decompress the nerves. This includes discectomy procedures. To realign the spine or to stabilize the spine. Realignment and stabilization procedures usually require instrumentation and fusion. Each of the procedures may be done in isolation or more than one procedure may be done, depending on your particular situation. Decompression surgery is required when one or more of the structures in the spine are compressing the spinal cord or nerve roots. These structures can include disc material, thickened ligaments, bone or scar tissue. The aim of a decompression is to remove those structures compressing the nerves, relieving the pressure on the nerves in order to improve your leg symptoms predominantly pain. Fusion surgery will stop movement in the area of the spine being operated on. This can be done using rods and screws as well as cages and plates. Rods and screws on their own may be used to help stabilize the spine if one vertebra has slipped forward on another after extensive decompression surgery or to prevent movement of painful arthritic joints in the spine. Where nerve roots are also being compressed because of severe disc problems, the disc may be removed and replaced with an implant or cage. The cage is then packed with bone graft that will gradually fuse the two bones together over the coming months. When cages and bone graft are used like this, the screws and rods will usually be used to build a scaffold around the spine to stabilize it while the bone graft is fusing the two bones together. Your surgeon will decide where your incision or cut will be depending on several factors such as which levels of the spine are being operated on and previous spinal surgery. While the incisions for some spinal surgeries may be from the front or at the side of the abdomen, the majority of spinal surgery is performed through a small incision in your back the length of operations can vary hugely depending on many factors such as the complexity of the operation, how many levels of the spine are being operated on and how difficult it is to access that area of the spine. Hopefully, by the end of this film, you will feel more prepared for your surgery. I would hope that any expectations or concerns that you may have about your surgery have been addressed. If you do have any further questions, please feel free to ask the physiotherapists or your surgical team when you see them next. Before you come in for your operation, there are some simple things to think about in order to make your hospital experience better and your recovery at home easier. Think about making your life as healthy as possible in the run-up to your surgery. Eat healthy food and eat well your body will need a lot of energy and nutrients for the healing process during your recovery in hospital and at home. Try to cut down on your alcohol consumption in the run-up to your surgery and avoid drinking any alcohol for at least 48 hours before coming into hospital. If you smoke, we know that stopping or cutting down on the number of cigarettes provides huge health benefits, even if it is a day or two before your surgery. 
smoking can affect healing rates, both of your wound and bony fusion. The hospital is a non-smoking site and we can provide help and advice regarding nicotine gums and patches to help you. If you need any advice about cutting down on smoking, drinking or leading a healthier lifestyle, please phone the relevant number at the end of the film or discuss with a health professional when you see someone next. If you are prone to infections or have any ongoing infections at the time of surgery, please let the ward or the surgeon's secretary know as soon as possible before your admission to hospital. Infections such as urinary tract infections, ingrowing toenails and tooth infections may mean your surgery is postponed until a later date. This is to prevent the risk of the surgical site getting infected. Think about setting your home up so that life is easier when you go home from hospital. The occupational therapists are a team who can advise on maintaining your independence with everyday tasks following your surgery. Here is one of the occupational therapy team with some advice for preparing for your operation. Hi there, I'm Bev Pretty, part of the occupational therapy team here at University Hospital Landoc. Before you come into hospital, you will find that preparing for your stay will make your recovery easier once you leave. Initially, you will find it easier to get on and off high chairs, beds, and so think about your furniture that is suitable before you come in. A chair with arms, for example, will be easier to sit or stand from than a low sofa. Think about how you will manage household chores, such as changing your bed, shopping and cleaning, cooking, and after your operation, your ability to do these activities will be restricted. You may find it helpful to change your bed and clean the house before coming in, as well as getting in some easy to cook meals. Internet shopping can also be very useful during the early phase of your recovery. If you are responsible, to provide care for others, consider how your surgery will impact on this. It is unlikely that you will be able to pick up your children or walk dogs, for example, for a few weeks after your surgery. When packing your bag for your stay, think about the clothing to bring in. We recommend loose, comfortable clothing. Clothing should be easy to put on and not too tight around your waist. It can get quite warm on the wards so layers may be better than thicker clothes. Slippers should be practical, preferably with backs to them, and we would always recommend you wear slippers when walking on the ward. As occupational therapists, we do not see spinal patients routinely on the ward. However, if at any point you want to speak to an occupational therapist, please let one of the staff on the ward know, and they can get in touch with us. There are occupational therapy spinal information leaflets available with more detailed advice, so please ask if you would like one. Hopefully now you will feel a bit more prepared and ready before coming into hospital. You will be asked to phone up on the day of admission to check that your bed is available. On rare occasions, the hospital may have to cancel surgery if there is no bed available. For example, due to emergency admissions or if a high dependency unit bed is required for your post-operative care and is not available. When you come into hospital, please bring all correspondence from the hospital with you, as well as any medications you are on and any scans or x-rays you may have yourself. Hello, I'm Helen, the ward sister on West 5. My team and I will be looking after your nursing care during your stay in hospital. When you arrive on the ward, please make your way to the ward reception where you'll be greeted by a member of staff who will then either show you to your bed area or to a waiting room. Once by your bedside, you'll be settled into the ward and shown where things are, such as the day room and the toilets. Each bed area has a chair, bed and a cupboard for storing clothes and toiletries. By your bed will be your name board. If you like to be called something other than your official name, please tell us and we'll write it above your bed. You may also notice a ticket home board with a predicted date of discharge written on it that estimates when you're likely to be going home. This is only a guide and is by no means set in stone. If you reach your predicted date of discharge and are not yet ready to go home, then you'll stay in hospital until you are. If on the other hand, you are safe and ready to go before that date, we'll not keep you any longer than you need to be. There's free Wi-Fi in the hospital and there's room for electronic devices such as tablets, laptops, etc. But these are brought in at your own risk as we're unable to lock them up for you. 
Also, please do not bring in large amounts of cash. You're able to use the phones on the ward and charge mobile phones, but if you're using your phone and a member of staff comes to your bed, we ask you to please end your call as quickly as you can. Please also label all charges that you bring in as we get lots of them left behind. On your first night, we know it's difficult, but try to relax and get a good night's sleep. Reading or listening to music can help, as well as earplugs. You may find it more comfortable to bring in your own pillow and pillowcase. At some point before your operation, you'll be seen by a doctor to clerk you in, and they will also check whether things have changed since your pre-admission appointment. You will also be seen by an anaesthetist to discuss your anaesthesia and your pain relief after your operation. You'll be measured for some surgical stockings, and you'll need to wear these on the morning of your surgery. These help to reduce your risk of blood clots or DVTs in your legs and your nurse will confirm how long you have to wear them after your operation. You may also be seen by other members of the multidisciplinary team such as physiotherapists or the pain team. Hello, my name is Lizzie Jones and I'm the surgical care practitioner and I work for the spinal team here in Clandock. So, on the morning of your operation, you will be asked to take a shower and then put on your surgical gown and your surgical stockings. Then you have to stay on the ward until you go to surgery. Unfortunately, it is impossible to give you an accurate time of when you will go to theatre, but the nursing staff can give you a rough estimate the morning of your operation. So when you go to surgery, a theatre porter and a member of the ward staff will come and collect you and take you to theatre. You will then be greeted by a member of the theatre staff and then taken into the anaesthetic room. After your operation is finished, you'll be taken to the recovery room. Here the recovery nurses will be keeping a close eye on you as you come around from your general anaesthetic. Once they're happy that you're recovering well, you'll be brought back to the ward. The amount of time you spend in theatre is variable depending on your operation, but usually you'll be off the ward for around three to four hours in total. Once back on the ward, the nursing staff will be regularly checking your heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, breathing rate and your oxygen levels. And they'll also be asking how you're feeling. As a side effect to the anaesthetic, you may feel some nausea and may feel drowsy. This can be a common side effect after a general anaesthetic and the nursing staff can give you some medication if you are suffering from nausea. During surgery, a wound drain will probably be inserted into the operation site. This consists of a small plastic tube coming out of your skin close to your incision. The tube is attached to a small clear bag allowing any excess fluid and blood to drain away from the operation site. This drain is normally removed 24 to 48 hours after your operation in a relatively painless procedure done by the staff on the ward. It's important to know that you may not see an immediate improvement. Some symptoms may take several weeks to improve as your body heals and swelling goes down. Your surgeon will have discussed recovery with you and addressed your expectations. You may also feel some different sensations in your legs for example, heaviness, pins and needles, or numbness. This does not mean that anything has gone wrong with your operation. Nerves are quite sensitive and your surgeon may need to move nerves around to make sure there's nothing compressing them. This can irritate the nerves and can cause some different sensations for a short time after your operation. It's important that you let the ward staff know what you're feeling so we can monitor your symptoms as needed. A large part of your recovery will involve the management of your post-operative pain. Here at University Hospital Flandock, we have a team of specialist nursing staff who are dedicated to management of post-operative pain. Overnight when the pain team are not here, there is also an on-call anaesthetist available to help manage your pain. Here is one of the pain team to talk about pain relief in more detail. Hi, I'm Charlotte, one of the pharmacy team at University Hospital Landock. After your operation, you will not be completely pain-free. Some pain is normal. You will have some pain around the operation site and this may be a different type of pain than you've had before. When you return from surgery, you may have patient-controlled analgesia or PCA pump if appropriate. This consists of a syringe of painkiller medication attached to a plastic tube that goes into the back of your hand. You control this using a button and press it as and when you need pain relief. 
The painkiller is normally morphine based if you're able to have morphine. Even if you press the button lots of times, you cannot overdose on it as the machine will only deliver a safe dose of painkiller once every five minutes. The PCA is normally removed the day after surgery and you will then start taking regular painkiller tablets. This will probably include paracetamol. Paracetamol, when used in combination with other painkillers, makes them more effective. As well as your regular painkillers, you will be prescribed some breakthrough pain relief that is quick acting and short lasting. It is important that your pain is managed well in between your regular painkillers. So please ask for this pain relief as soon as you feel you need it. This may be before you are likely to do some activity, such as walking or washing. If you feel your pain is not under control, please let one of the nursing staff know and they can arrange a review of your painkillers. It is important to say that you are unlikely to go home pain free. It can take several weeks for the post-operative pain to gradually settle down. However, when you go home from hospital, we want your pain to be at a comfortable enough level to allow you to walk around and do the everyday activities that you need to. If you have any questions about pain relief after your operation, please contact the ward numbers given at the end of the film. Because you will have been nil by mouth before your operation, it's important to start eating and drinking well afterwards in order to give your body energy and nutrients to help your recovery. You will be provided with breakfast, lunch and dinner on the ward, but sometimes, especially following a general anaesthetic, you may not feel like eating at those times. There are always other foods kept on the ward, like sandwiches, fruit, yoghurts, cereal and toast. So if you don't feel you can eat at meal times, please ask your nurse for something to eat later on when you are feeling hungry. It's also important to start drinking plenty of water after your operation to help keep your blood pressure up and to help replace any fluids lost in theatre. Nurses can seem to be a bit obsessed with your bowels because we will frequently be asking you about them. This is because your bowels can be a bit slow to start working properly after an operation, especially when on the lower back. A combination of general anaesthetic, post-operative nausea, strong painkillers, periods of immobility and reduced food and water intake can make your bowels a bit sluggish. Because of this, laxatives will be prescribed for you to take after your operation, so you don't have to strain in order to open your bowels. If you have problems with constipation before your operation, it may be helpful to talk to your GP or pharmacist about ways to help keep you more regular before you come into hospital. After your operation, your nurse can let you know what your surgeon has used to close your wound. Usually they will use absorbable stitches in the deeper tissues and then some simple paper stitches over the skin. You will also have a dressing over your wound to keep it clean and protected. Unless we need to, this dressing will not be removed until the day you are going home when we will check your wound and apply a new dressing. Unfortunately, in any surgery, there is the potential for complications and your surgeon will have discussed these with you during one of your clinic appointments. This next section is not designed to scare you off, but some of these complications can occur after you've gone home, so it's important to know what to look for. Following a general anaesthetic, there is a small chance of developing a chest infection. Having a temperature and coughing, especially if you're coughing up phlegm, may be a sign of this. Regular deep breathing after your anaesthetic can help prevent chest infections by clearing secretions from the base of your lungs. There is a small risk of developing a DVT or deep vein thrombosis after an operation. This is a blood clot in one of the veins in your legs. These are very rare in spinal patients as you likely will be up and walking around very soon after the operation. But to further reduce the risk of DVT, every patient will be given a pair of attractive surgical stockings to wear after their operation and also fitted with foot pumps to wear when they're in bed. If a blood clot did form in a vein in your leg, you may get some pain in your calf with redness and swelling in your lower leg. There is a small possibility that part of this could break off, travel through the bloodstream and get lodged in one of the blood vessels in your lungs. This is called a pulmonary embolism. Again, this is very rare, but if it were to happen, you may experience some chest pain, shortness of breath or cough up phlegm that was streaked with some blood. If you think you might have developed a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism, 
you should go to your nearest A&E department to get checked out. After any operation, there is a possibility of developing a wound infection. Redness, swelling and leaking around the wound may be a sign of infection. You may also feel feverish or have a temperature. If you think your wound might be infected, then please call the ward and speak to one of the nursing staff. Your surgeon will usually want you to come back into hospital so that they or one of their spinal team can assess the wound personally. Occasionally, during the operation, the lining around your nerves may be damaged, causing spinal fluid to leak out. This is called a dural tear. If this happens, it's usually spotted by the surgeon in theatre and repaired, but this would likely mean that you would be kept flat in bed for two to three days to allow the repair to properly seal. On some occasions, a dural tear can develop after surgery and after you've gone home. If this is the case, you may experience headaches that are worse on standing or sitting up and exacerbated by light. You may also feel some nausea. If you experience this kind of headache after surgery, it's important that you inform your nurse if you're still in hospital or contact the ward staff if you've already been discharged home. Hopefully this hasn't put you off coming in for your operation altogether. Georgina is now going to talk to you about what you can expect from the physiotherapist. Physiotherapy treatment on the ward usually starts with a pre-operative visit if we're able to see you before theatre. Post-operative physiotherapy usually starts the day after surgery, but if you wish to, you can get up in the night or the following morning with the help of the nursing staff as long as it's safe to do so. We will check your surgeon's notes that they write detailing what was done in your operation and their post-operative instructions. You may also need to wear a brace after your operation. This is more common if there are multiple spinal levels that have been operated on and if your surgeon wants more support whilst your spine is healing. This is normally if there is metalwork in place. If you do need a brace, we will explain when you need to wear it and how you put it on and take it off. The initial physiotherapy session consists of an assessment of your muscle power and sensation in your legs, as well as getting you out of bed and walking. On the first day, we will help you to move out of bed using a log roll technique to minimise pain and maintain spinal posture. This involves rolling onto your side and bringing your legs over the edge of the bed, sitting up in one movement. It's quite normal to feel a bit dizzy the first time you get up and this should settle quickly. If it does not settle, we may help you to get back into bed and try again later in the day. We will gradually increase the distance that you walk and give you less physical support as appropriate. We aim to get you up and walking without walking aids, such as elbow crutches or Zimmer frames. This helps your posture and reduces pressure put through your spine. If, however, you're using walking aids before surgery, we may still use them afterwards if you need that extra support. It is important to regularly change position and we recommend staying in one position for a maximum of 20 to 30 minutes. It's okay to lie down on the bed during the day and we would encourage this to help offload your spine and enable you to rest and sleep if necessary. You will be shown two different exercises on the ward, one for your deep abdominal muscles and one for keeping your sciatic nerves moving regularly during your recovery. Neither of these exercises should be painful and you will have the chance to practice them on the ward before going home. The abdominal exercise works on a muscle called transversus abdominis. This is the deepest muscle of your abdominal muscles and helps to provide muscular support for your lower back. To activate this muscle, gently pull in the lower section of your abdomen between your belly button and your pubic bone and contract your pelvic floor muscles at the same time. These are the muscles you would use if you were trying to stop yourself passing water. Then hold this contraction for five seconds while you carry on breathing. As you can see in the video, you should not tilt your pelvis or lift your bottom up off the bed. The second exercise is to keep your sciatic nerves moving while your back heals. It's important for nerves to be kept supple so they are able to more easily slide and glide when you move your back and your legs during everyday activities. Starting by lying on your side with your better leg uppermost and a pillow between your knees, straighten your knee and then pull your toes towards you. Then point your toes away from you and bend your knee back to the original position. If during this movement you start to feel a stretch anywhere from your lower back, down your back of your leg, into your foot, you should immediately return to the starting position. This exercise should be a constant smooth movement and you should not hold any position. If it is painful, take your knee further away from you, having less of a bend at your hip. 
Then roll onto your other side in order to exercise the other leg. Resting positions can be a bit of trial and error, depending on what is comfortable for you, but there are two positions that tend to be the most commonly comfortable. If you lie on your back, place some pillows underneath your knees to make you more comfortable. If you want to lie on your side, it doesn't matter which side it is, but you may need to alternate it. But place a pillow between your knees and maybe one behind you to make yourself a bit more comfortable. Your physiotherapy treatment in hospital ends when you have achieved several goals for discharge. These include walking safely both on the flat and up and down stairs if necessary, getting on and off the bed independently and doing your exercise as well. We may refer you on for further physiotherapy treatment at your nearest outpatient department. The physiotherapist on the ward will discuss this with you before you are discharged. Following your operation, there may be some limitations on what you can do and can't do in order to allow healing and optimise your recovery. These vary for different operations. Driving is not recommended for the first six weeks, but this time limit can be reduced or increased depending on your particular circumstances. You can travel in a car at any time, but may find it comfortable to have a pillow on the seat or behind your back. You may also need to stop at regular intervals to get out of the car for a walk around or a change of position. If you are just having a decompression, you are able to move as comfort allows. We recommend to avoid heavy lifting for six weeks to allow the soft tissues time to heal up and to always think about maintaining good posture. If you have had a discectomy, you should avoid excessive twisting and bending, especially at the same time. You also need to avoid bending too far forward, either when standing or sitting, especially to lift something up. This is to avoid putting too much force through your disc and allow the weakness in your disc to heal up. We also recommend avoiding heavy lifting for the first six weeks. If you have had a fusion, you are to avoid excessive or repetitive twisting, bending and heavy lifting for 12 weeks. This is to allow for the bones in your back to get a good solid fix on any screws that are used in your operation and also to allow any bone graft used to solidify and create a stable fusion between bones in your back. After a fusion operation, your main form of exercise will be walking as this is a good low impact, low intensity activity that will promote healing in your back and increase your fitness at the same time. Although there are some restrictions following your surgery, you are allowed to move and it is important that you move and walk around. Some pain is to be expected. As your recovery continues, we recommend that you gradually increase your activities every few days if you're comfortable. Your discharge from hospital depends on a number of things. A healthy wound. You'll have a wound check on the day of discharge. If your wound is leaking or bleeding, you may not be discharged until it's dry. This may mean spending a day or two longer in hospital to allow it to be monitored. If needed, you will have an x-ray and this needs to be reviewed by the spinal team before you go home. Sometimes you need to have had your bowels open before going home. If you normally have problems with constipation, please speak to your GP or pharmacist before you come in and make the nursing staff aware when you're on the ward. Your pain needs to be controlled in order for you to go home and you need to have adequate support when you are discharged. On the day of discharge, you will be given relevant information sheets. Your consultant follow-up appointment will also be given to you. And you will have information about making further appointments with your GP practice nurse for a wound check. The ward staff will give you a supply of medication to go home with. And if you are unsure about anything, please ask. If you have any questions when you get home, please ring the number at the end of the film and get in touch there is always someone available to speak to on the ward. You should know your potential discharge date at least the day before you go, so please arrange if you can to be picked up before 12 o'clock. This will allow us to get the bed area ready for the next patient coming in. Over the first few weeks following your operation, try to gradually increase your activity levels as comfort allows. If you have been referred for further physiotherapy, please continue to attend and follow the advice regarding your recovery. Returning to work will be dependent on what you've had done and what your job entails, so we can talk to you in more detail on an individual basis. As a rough guide, people who have had fusion surgery and those doing manual jobs will take longer to get back to work. The advice is similar for returning to sport. 
If it is a contact sport, it may take longer to return than non-contact. If you've had a fusion, you will be more restricted than if you've had a decompression alone. Please speak to your physiotherapist or consultant at your follow-up appointments if you have any questions about this or you need guidance for returning to sport or work. You can usually return to driving after you've been reviewed by your consultant at clinic. This is normally around six weeks post-operatively. If you choose to resume driving before your follow-up appointment with your consultant, then it is your responsibility to ensure that you are able to perform all actions necessary to drive safely. According to Rule 90 of the Highway Code, you must make sure that you are fit to drive. You must report to the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency, the DVLA, any health condition likely to affect your driving. Also, Rule 96 states, you must not drive under the influence of drugs or medicine. For medicines, check with your doctor or pharmacists and do not drive if you were advised that you may be impaired. When you return to driving, you need to be confident of being able to turn around to have good vision of the road and to be able to perform an emergency stop. We also suggest contacting your insurance company before you resume driving to ensure that you are covered under your policy. You can usually return to intimate relations when you feel comfortable to do so. This may be up to six weeks after your operation and may involve some modification to ensure comfort. If you have any questions about this, please ask the physiotherapist on the ward. We hope your stay in hospital is a good experience. If at any time you've got questions or concerns, please speak to one of the ward staff. We look forward to welcoming you to University Hospital Flandock.